the presentation. Okay, so we are all set on that. <clears throat> so last time we were discussing <clears throat> um, different on scale factor, what are different species uh, which are present in our environment starting from atoms all the way to uh, larger uh, animals and plants. And that's we already covered, so I will not go into those details again. Uh, you can watch previous lecture. But now, let's start with um, the cells. So there are actually two kind of cells. One are prokaryotic cells, the other are eukaryotic cells. In prokaryotic, the cells are, so they don't have a very well-defined uh, membrane, and they also don't have well-defined nucleus, the prokaryotic cells. So these are mostly single cell organelles, means the small organisms which are composed of only single cell, okay? Like bacteria, so bacteria is considered a cell, but it's just a single cell pathogen, okay? Pathogen or it is also helpful in digestion or other uh, systematic mechanisms inside our body. But uh, we also might have uh, uh, learned during your high school amoeba, right? Amoeba also changes shape all the time. So they don't have very well-defined surface um, uh, shape. So they change shape and also their nucleus uh, is, uh, they have a DNA. It's not like they don't have a DNA. They have a DNA, but it's not packed inside a nucleus. So they don't have a well-defined nucleus. It's just moving around inside their cell. But, uh, but most of the human cells and plant cells, which we have seen more and will go through more, uh, is eukaryotic cells. Uh, eukaryotic means uh, EU is a true nucleus, basically. Uh, so they have a true nucleus like uh, human cells uh, inside the cytoplasm, and they have other cell organelles, which are also membrane-bound. So let's look at the prokaryotic cells first. So this is how the prokaryotic cells looks like. So you will have a membrane, a ribosomes. So we'll, we'll go through each one of those details. Okay, what, what are ribosomes? What is this? What is that? Okay. They have a plasma inside. This is a plasma membrane. This is a real image, by the way. And this is just a, a representation of how this will look like. And then you will also see the white segments here inside. That's genetic material. Okay, this is how the DNA is packed. So it's not, you can see that it's not well packed inside a single nucleus. So it's uh, pretty much distributed. Some of those uh, prokaryotic cells have uh, tails, like sperm tails, so, so that they can swim because they are single uh, cell organelles, organisms, so they have to sometimes move from one place to other to find food or other stuff. So they, they need some swimming capability, so they, they have a flagellum or tail, so which helps them to actually swim. Inside a cell, again, you have a plasma membrane, which is around on, on the surface. You have a nucleus. Uh, these are, when you have a nucleus, so this is more about uh, when we're talking about the animal cell or eukaryotic cell. Mitochondria, uh, so nucleus basically have a genetic information, uh, like all of your DNA. So mitochondria uh, also have uh, some mitochondrial genetic information, but basically its main purpose is to uh, generate energy. Uh, it's, a, it's called powerhouse for a cell. So basically, it converts energy into ATP, which cell consumes consumes um, by utilizing a process of respiration. So that's why the uh, you can your body can get energy and cells can live for longer. So ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi pleurs. So all these three things are involved in protein synthesis. When I say, okay, we have a DNA information inside a nucleus, but how come just a DNA? DNA is a code, as we discussed, okay? So what kind of proteins will be expressed? But more functional part is a protein. When the proteins are expressed inside a uh, cell, that defines how a cell will behave uh, later on. So, uh, but how those proteins are expressed? Uh, so. So basically, in per, from the DNA, there is some RNAs which are involved to transfer that uh, genetic information to the ribosomes, uh, which are small organelles, and the ribosomes actually helps synthesize the amino acids based on the sequence. So basically, that sequence which we have in a DNA 
that is uh, used as a code to build structure in the ribosomes okay so that's actually your uh, your design what kind of proteins will be expressed and how many of them but where it is being constructed or made is the ribosomes and the Golgi operators also help them to fold the structures and then send it some some protein stays inside a cell some goes outside depends on uh, their function but this is how it work and we have a very nice movie actually today I'll show you I found it um, uh, previously uh, that movie was uh, present on a Harvard website on in some department uh, it said mostly animation it shows you what kind of processes are going on inside a cell but then they it looks like they have removed it from that link but I just searched it and I found it actually on a YouTube now it's available and I just have a link in the presentation so we can go to th uh, go through uh, that we'll go through that um, video during this class okay so another view for animal cells so in animal cell you can see so these are some important structures which we will see um, uh, so what we have missed so far is actually cytoskeleton so these are actually polymer polymerous filament filaments uh, all tangled together and uh, they they actually give mechanical strength to the to any cell so because cell is in general liquid right so it has a cytoplasm inside um, which is also just liquid and then there are small organelles so when you say cell organelles basically it's a cell organ so organ is used for uh, human organs like our heart lungs so but inside a cell when we talk about small parts we call them organelles okay like small organs so let's look at the cytoskeleton first for example so cytoskeleton give a physical properties or mechanical properties of the cell otherwise it will be hard to maintain a shape but these filaments you can see that they are tremendous in number and uh, and they are made up of also protein and polymers um, and and they and they maintain the shape so I told you before that when and they have a lot of uh, uh, relevance to many diseases for example I mentioned the cancer cells uh, have to migrate from one place to other place and um, uh, they, they do migrate and then and that's how the cancer metastasize okay from one location to other and uh, so but inside of in, and they, how they can move from one place to other is mostly through the blood and, and that's why we call them also circulating tumor cells the ones which are not local anymore which travels through the blood and now in this case the cells have to really uh, become flexible in many cancers so that they can actually move through the small arteries and veins uh, and how they can become flexible uh, basically they will change their cytoskeleton structure right so they will arrange it or reduce the number of uh, filaments which are available so that they can uh, they can really uh, become flexible so you can you can, they can pass through a small uh, small openings. Uh, I showed you, I think, in the previous, oh, no, no, in the previous, the uh, in the last week or sometime, that uh, uh, one essay from one of the papers where it shows that when we put put a cancer cell on one side and there were microfluidic channels, and uh, there was a regular cell uh, in another experiment, and again same device where we have microfluidic channels. So the cancer cells were able to migrate to the other side although their sizes were pretty larger as compared to the micro channel size but they squeezed through it on the other hand the normal cells were not able to do that only maybe hardly one or two so that tells you that a lot of people actually just work on the mechanical properties and see how these are different <laughs> within the cell when they are disease cells or not disease cells um, I know in, in case of I think of malaria also the cell changes shape uh, the red blood cells and uh, and that's a very clear signal a lot of other diseases when the a uh, lot of red blood cell related diseases the RBC structure also changes and RBC red blood cell uh, shape also changes so typically it's a donut shape but later on it can become more moon shape or uh, more uh, smaller in size so that also tells you and they also change the rigidity so that tells you that okay uh, these cells are disease cells not a normal cell and that's the one biomarker how you can look at uh, whether this is a disease cell or not 
but this is not a uni universal principle. It means you cannot apply that in all different cell types. So you really have to find out whether uh, the mechanical property based signal or shape of a cell is relevant for that specific disease or for a specific situation. But there are quite a few um, scenarios where cell shape and uh, their flexibility is important to distinguish between cancerous and non-cancer cells. Like under the microscope, people nowadays, when the people who, uh, who who are working in pathology, they sometimes don't use even stains. They look under the microscope and see how cell shape look like, and they can differentiate with some success more than 50% whether it's a cancer cell or not cancer cell. Okay, so yeah, these shapes and how cells are formed, so it is uh, relevant uh, to overall uh, characteristics of the cell, uh, but not always. So that is important. So mitochondria is uh, the power, as I told you. So uh, it generates, uh, it converts energy by the respiration to ATP, and which is used. So the other important uh, organelle is actually nucleus. So in nucleus, if you see inside a nucleus, there will be a DNA information. Your chromosomes will be inside, and which has all the DNA. Uh, and then you will see how these things can transport from inside to outside. So if the everything is inside a nucleus, then how come the things can come out? Uh, you will see the small dots on the nucleus, the purple nucleus. So those dots are actually the nucleus pores, and they are nanoscale. They are not larger. So when they are uh, nanoscale, it means uh, uh, large uh, uh, organelles or um, pathogens cannot go inside, but but then the DNA can be transported outside. So if the DNA can be transported outside uh, to ribosomes for the protein to get uh, expressed, so it means we can also transfer some DNA inside, right, from outside if we want to. And um, you might have heard about gene therapy, right? So in gene therapy, uh, the goal is to, if we know that, okay, this is a specific segment of a DNA, which is now mutated, it means it's not good, uh, it's changed, and that's why it is producing cells, cancer cells, or the cancer cells that can be cancer. So the, the one idea is, okay, why not we identify those areas? And from outside, we transfer DNA and replace that segment with the with the corrected or unmutated uh, version of the DNA sequence, so in that way the cell will not be, stay cancerous. So that's a gene therapy, and that can be used for just a cancer is one example. So many other diseases where the DNA is involved, um, the with the gene uh, it can be modified, and people have shown some success uh, in doing it. Uh, I'm not sure about it, whether gene therapy is uh, available uh, in the clinics also or not for main disease, but I have seen a lot of work in uh, literature. People are currently working on gene therapy. If we can efficiently transfer DNA inside uh, the nucleus and they change the uh, uh, sequence of a gene, okay? And that is done through the these pores, okay? And so it means if you have a carrier, the carrier also have to be smaller than the and the nucleus pore size, okay? Or you can just use the, uh, uh, you can use just a DNA fragments, not really any uh, carrier. So it really depends. There are different approaches how you can do it. Sometimes we need a carrier to actually transport the material, uh, let's say uh, some DNA sequence inside a cell through a membrane. Once in inside, then it dissolves, and then it releases the DNA, and then DNA automatically diffuses inside the cell. But there should be some way also to um, integrate it with inside, uh, inside the original DNA and replace it. So the whole process is not really simple, so there are quite a few things involved, but this is the basic idea. Then, um, then you have, um, in cytoplasm, you see these curly structures. These are actually, endoplasmic reticulum. So endoplasmic reticulum, there are two types. One is a rough and one is smooth. So in smooth endoplasmic reticulum, you don't have ribosomes, but in a rough endoplasmic reticulum, you have ribosomes on the surface of endoplasmic reticulum. And so the ribosomes, uh, okay, whatever DNA sequence is in, the, in there, the that information is copied in a, another segment 
uh, which is uh, called RNA. Okay, so ribonucleic acid. Uh, and then the RNA actually is transferred. So it's kind of we are sending a message from inside to outside. So RNA is then transported to outside, and that information now is read by ribosomes, and it synthesizes the star synthesizing protein based on whatever sequence is present there. Okay, and then and then uh, uh, there is a Golgi apparatus there, another uh, organelle which helps actually to fold the proteins in different shapes. Uh, protein is very, it's very important to fold them in different shapes for their proper functionality. So, okay, what else we have here? Important. There are some also free ribosomes also available inside a cell of let's go on. So, a cytoplasm inside a cell, okay, we didn't talk about the cytoplasm yet, but so cytoplasm is a fruit-like structure or it's a watery, um, uh, matrix inside a cell where all the other organelles are present floating and that's also a transport media. It means uh, if you have to transport RNA or DNA or proteins are synthesized and moving outside or inside a cell, that is done, it requires some media and um, that's actually a cytoplasm. And the organelles and particles are suspended inside the uh, cytoplasm. Okay, when we look at the um, plasma membrane, uh, that plays a very important role um, to maintain cell, uh, cell functionality. Um, in plasma membrane, is complicated. In the one major component of the plasma membrane, can you recognize what component is the major component? Which, which structures are more repeated or they're more in concentration? Phospholipid bilayer, the red heads and uh, yellowish tails, orange tails, right? So those are phospholipids. And you know, uh, I told you earlier that phospholipids, uh, their heads are hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Hydrophobic heads, right? So if their heads are hydrophobic, how can they can face the water? Because this is our membrane, so outside there is a plasma, right? Uh, there is a blood, so it's uh, more hydrophilic. And then also inside the cell, there is also a cytoplasm, which is watery, so it's also hydrophobic, uh, hydrophilic, sorry. So the outside and inside of a cell is hydrophilic. Now, then if that is true, then it means the, the heads should be hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Then head need to be, so what, okay, hydrophilic likes hydrophilic? Or hydrophilic like hydrophobic? In general, hydrophilic like hydrophilic or hydrophilic like hydrophobic? What do you think? Hydrophilics like hydrophilic, right? So in this case, then these heads has to be hydrophilic. And that's why they want to face the water and the tails are hydrophobic, so they will try to hide away from the hydrophilic part, so that's why they're inside, right? So they are not liking water, so they are hiding inside. And that self-assembly maintains the cell st membrane structure because of these hydrophilic, hydrophobic interactions. The cell automatically arranged in this format. So that's the major component. And inside that you will see there are a lot of proteins um, which are present on a membrane. So whenever we say, okay, we can target uh, different proteins uh, for uh, for drug delivery, for example, when we say targeted drug delivery, so we can uh, functionalize our particles with some antibodies or proteins which can go and bind with the cell. Or when we say, okay, this is a special kind of a cell which expresses certain proteins on the surface. So most of the time, in that case, we are targeting the cell membrane because when nanoparticles goes close to the cells, it first thing it has to bypass is actually a cell membrane. And if it cannot differentiate cells based on the protein, uh, the cell membrane protein expression, it means that we cannot really target our drug to specific um, uh, cell types. Uh, so it's very important to find out what is expressed more or less on different cell types. And that is very, very important for uh, 
treatment and also very important for you in diagnostics. So when we say in diagnostics, when we want to isolate certain cell types for some application, I can give you one example. Um, you know, people who are affected with the HIV, their CD4 T cells, which is one type of white blood cells, they are mostly affected. So those are actually housed for the viruses. So viruses attack the CD4 T cells. And then the CD4 T cells, they grow there most of the time. So, and then they later on, they kill those cells, okay? So that's why the CD4 T cells amount or their number falls down inside the blood for, with the, for the people who have active HIV disease. So one way to diagnose whether someone has HIV or not is that you can look at the CD4 T cells, right? How many CD4 T cells are in blood at someone's pers um, in someone's blood? And there are some good range of numbers available. Like people who are healthy, they should have, for example, 500 or more CD4 T cells per microliter of a blood. Microliter is very very small. Okay, so that number should be there. Let's say if someone has less than 500, so there are chances that he might be affected with HIV or some other immune disease. Because CD4, it's not only HIV who affects the CD4 T cells, there are other uh, immunocompromised conditions. For example, if someone is going through chemotherapy, their immune response also slows down. So in that case, CD4 cell count is also affected. But yes, it can be used as one of a biomarker. Mostly it's used during a treatment phase. When someone has HIV and they are given drugs, it's called the uh, uh, ART and those drugs uh, once uh, then we have to monitor a patient whether how he's responding to drugs because sometimes the viruses actually generate some resistance against those drugs so it means the drugs are not much effective like we have seen in antibiotics which you might have some idea because antibiotics if you take them for a long period of time over and over then it can produce some resistance inside the bacteria so next time when you take antibiotics uh, it will not affect the bacteria efficiently because now the bacteria are resistant to that specific drug. And that kind of uh, resistance is also seen uh, in, a, in a cancer also. Uh, and that's why we have to change. Um, it's called the multi-drug resistance. And so the cancer cells also, with the time, can generate resistance to specific drug type and then that drug is not really effective. So then normally in a treatment phase, they have to change uh, different drugs and test, okay, which one is working for which patient, so it's complicated. So uh, basically these uh, cells and pathogens, actually they have a mechanism with which they can produce resistance inside for a specific drug. So in that, in the case of HIV, the example which I was giving you, the CD4 cells, um, sometimes they, they are not responsive to ART anymore, and uh, and the viruses are not respond, responding to ART anymore, so they still keep growing and still killing the uh, CD4 T cells, so it, it means they're affecting your uh, immunity, okay? So the other diseases can attack you very easily. So what happens that we can, we always look at, the clinicians always look at the CD4 count to find out if someone who is being treated is responding to the treatment or not. Let's say if you're giving a dose, okay, the person might be feeling better, the maybe virus count is getting down in a plasma, but you have still low number of CD4 cells that tells you something that their immune health is still compromised, so it's not improving. So then you have to change the treatment. So yes, it's actually used for taking decisions during the treatment, okay? So, and how that is possible, the CD4 T cells how we can quantify, okay, how many CD4 T cells are inside the blood. So one easy way is to quantify is to actually look for cells which have CD4 protein on the surface. So CD4 protein is expressed on the cell surface. All these things which we are seeing here, so many of them are proteins. The same glycoprotein, right, this one, globular protein, and they are, uh, there are some also ch ion channels, which I will talk in a minute, but basically there are proteins which are expressed on the cell surface. And so it means if we have um, a surface which we functionalize 
with something which is anti CD4. So anti will bind with the the antibody, for example. If we have antibody against CD4 and we functionalize the surface with the uh, that antibody, so if now flow cells on the surface, so only those cells will stick with the surface which have the CD4 protein, not other cells, right? Because other cells will not bind with it. CD4 anti antibody for CD4 will only bind specifically with the CD4 protein, and which is only expressed on the CD4 cells. So it means you can isolate CD4 cells from blood, and then once you isolate it, then you can actually quantify whether how many of them are there in the blood. So, so basically, the surface expression of the proteins is very important. And same is true when we look at, for example, uh, treatment options or. When we talk about targeted drug delivery, the biggest problem with the in the cancer patient is that the normal drugs, the chemotherapy, which is used, is uh, not very specific. So it affects other parts of the body. Ideally, we on, only want to find and kill cancer cells. But when people are treated, even nowadays, it has a lot of side effects. They have a hair fall, a lot of other things. Okay, and their immunity is compromised. Um, so. In, in that case, if we can have some formulation, somehow we can just target the cancer cells, that would be very, very helpful. <clears throat> so, um, some people think that, okay, instead of killing those cells, maybe we can transfer, we can uh, do gene therapy and maybe convert them back into normal cells. That would be even great. Uh, but yeah, there is some limited success in that also, but I don't know how where the field is right now, uh, clinically. But anyways, uh, so those proteins which are expressed on the surface are really, really uh, important. Uh, <clears throat> the proteins which are shown actually in a, in a blue, they are a membrane. So these are blue membrane proteins. So these all are blue, blue part which is shown as the membrane proteins, okay? And some are uh, actually can bypass through the membrane. So for example, this one, they are called the integral proteins, so they are bypassing through a membrane. So it means they they should have some hydrophilic and some hydrophobic part, right? Because in inside this will be hydrophobic, and then the outside this will be hydrophilic. And some proteins are only expressed uh, on the surface or inside. Like this is also under the surface. So they are mostly hydrophilic proteins, portion of the proteins, and. They are called the peripheral proteins or glycoproteins, which are many, which are also proteins which are important for cell functions. So, and there also are some ion channels. Um, cell maintain certain concentration of ions inside a cytoplasm, which is very really important for their functionality. Um, and so these channels regulate the uh, movement of ions inside and out. So there, you might have heard about the potassium ion channels and sodium ion channels. If they don't function properly, so cell cannot uh, function properly. So those ion channels are also well controlled. The concept of nanopore actually, which is used for DNA sequencing, came from ion, ion channels. Means if ion channels are very, very small, nanoscale, if it can be used, um, for transporting control transport of materials from one from outside to inside from inside to outside then then why not we can have pores like that very small pores and we can allow the uh, dna to pass through and try to read it with some sensing okay okay so so inside the cell we have uh, on the outside there are in in general we have uh, uh, proteins, we have uh, uh, DNA, and we also have lipids, okay? So lipids are mostly non polar so it's water insoluble, uh, because lipids is a fat, right? So some of the examples of lipids are um, fats and oils, phospholipids is also lipids, steroids is also uh, hormones, which are also, many of them are uh, fatty acids or lipids. Uh, before I continue with that more detail, I think uh, now people start feeling a bit sleepy, I noticed. Um, so let's play a movie and then we'll continue, okay? So maybe that will open your eyes a little bit. Yes! Ours is 
is still buffering. What's happening? You're experiencing a network delay. You both need to be watching that on the iPhone with Verizon. The best stream. Uh, is it uh, clearly visible or you want to turn off the light? It's fine. Okay. Can you try turning off the light? Let's see how does that look. I think it's better now, right? Yes. What? Okay, leave it. That's fine. Streaming <laughs> network. How long have you been here? I've been here a couple days. Get the best unlimited on the most awarded <laughs> network. Buy iPhone 8 and get one on us with no trade-in required. While red blood cells are carried away at high velocity by a strong blood flow, leukocytes roll slowly on endothelial cells. P-selectins on endothelial cells interact with PSGL1, a glycoprotein on leukocyte microvilli. Leukocytes, pushed by the blood flow, adhere and roll on endothelial cells because existing interactions are broken, while new ones are formed. These interactions are possible because the extended extracellular domains of both proteins emerge from the extracellular matrix, which covers the surface of both cell types. The outer leaflet of the lipid bilayer is enriched in sphingolipids and phosphatidylcholine. Sphingolipid-rich rafts raised above the rest of the leaflet recruit specific membrane proteins. Raft's rigidity is caused by the tight packing of cholesterol molecules against the straight sphingolipids hydrocarbon chains. Outside the rafts, kinks in unsaturated hydrocarbon chains and lower cholesterol concentration result in increased fluidity. At sites of inflammation, secreted chemokines bound to heparin sulfate proteoglycan on endothelial cells are presented to leukocyte 7 transmembrane receptors. The binding stimulates leukocytes and triggers an intracellular cascade of signaling reactions. The inner leaflet of the bilayer has a very different composition than that of the outer leaflet. While some proteins traverse the membrane, Others are either anchored into the inner leaflet by covalently attached fatty acid chains or are recruited through non-covalent interactions with membrane proteins. The membrane-bound protein complexes are critical for the transmission of signals across the plasma membrane. Beneath the lipid bilayer, spectrin tetramers arranged into a hexagonal network are anchored by membrane proteins. This network forms the membrane skeleton that contributes to membrane stability and membrane protein distribution. The cytoskeleton is comprised of networks of filamentous proteins that are responsible for the special organization of cytosolic components. Inside microvilli, actin filaments form tight parallel bundles, which are stabilized by cross-linking proteins. While deeper in the cytosol, the actin network adopts a gel-like structure, stabilized by a variety of actin-binding proteins. Filaments, capped at their minus ends by a protein complex, grow away from the plasma membrane by the addition of actin monomers to their plus end. The actin network is a very dynamic structure, with continuous directional polymerization and disassembly. Severing proteins induce kinks in the filament and lead to the formation of short fragments that rapidly depolymerize or give rise to new filaments. The cytoskeleton includes a network of microtubules created by the lateral association of protofilaments, formed by the polymerization of tubulin dimers. While the plus ends of some microtubules extend toward the plasma membrane, proteins stabilize the curved conformation of protofilaments from other microtubules, causing their rapid plus end depolymerization. Microtubules provide tracks along which membrane-bound vesicles travel to and from the plasma membrane. The directional movement of these cargo vesicles is due to a family of motor proteins linking vesicles and microtubules. Membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria are loosely trapped by the cytoskeleton. Mitochondria change shape continuously and their orientation is partly dictated by their interaction with microtubules. All the microtubules originate from the centrosome, a discrete fibrous structure containing two orthogonal centrioles and located near the cell nucleus.
pores in the nuclear envelope allow the import of particles containing mRNA and proteins into the cytosol. Here, free ribosomes translate the mRNA molecules into proteins. Some of these proteins will reside in the cytosol. Others will associate with specialized cytosolic proteins and be imported into mitochondria or other organelles. The synthesis of cell-secreted and integral membrane proteins is initiated by free ribosomes, which then dock to protein translocators at the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum. Nascent proteins pass through an aqueous pore in the translocator. Cell-secreted proteins accumulate in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum while integral membrane proteins become embedded in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. Proteins are transported from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus by vesicles traveling along the microtubules. Protein glycosylation, initiated in the endoplasmic reticulum, is completed inside the lumen of the Golgi apparatus. Fully glycosylated proteins are transported from the Golgi apparatus to the plasma membrane. When a vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane, proteins contained in the vesicle's lumen are secreted and proteins embedded in the vesicle's membrane diffuse in the cell membrane. At sites of inflammation, chemokines secreted by endothelial cells bind to the extracellular domains of G-protein-coupled membrane receptors. This binding causes a conformational change in the cytosolic portion of the receptor and the consequent activation of a subunit of the G-protein. The activation of the G-protein subunit triggers a cascade of protein activation, which in turn leads to the activation and clustering of integrins inside lipid rafts. A dramatic conformational change occurs in the extracellular domain of the activated integrins. This now allows for their interaction with ICAM proteins displayed at the surface of the endothelial cells. These strong interactions immobilize the rolling leukocyte at the site of inflammation. Additional signaling events cause a profound reorganization of the cytoskeleton, resulting in the spreading of one edge of the leukocyte. The leading edge of the leukocyte inserts itself between endothelial cells, and the leukocyte migrates through the blood vessel wall into the inflamed tissue. Rolling, activation, adhesion, and transendothelial migration are the four steps of a process called leukocyte extravasation. Okay, thank you. So there are actually quite a few other uh, good movies available. This was just one example, and you can see how complex the cell structure itself is. So a lot of things are going on inside a cell. A lot of people, thousands of people working to just understand how these structures are formed and why one changes or other changes. So it's very complex. Uh, but yes, we have a lot of knowledge. That's why we kind of discovered, okay, how these things are coordinated with one another. Okay, but still uh, there's a lot to dis uh, uh, discover in this domain. But anyways, going back to our lecture now, uh, you can watch this movie again at home. The link is provided, so it's up to you. So we were talking about the lipids, right? So lipids are present in uh, uh, two, three different forms, uh, from like uh, fats and all, uh, phospholipids and steroids. So then we have uh, fatty acids. So fatty acids are when uh, 
the lipids uh, binds with the uh, with the with the nonpolar hydrocarbon, which is actually lipid, uh, bind with the polar carboxylic group, or it makes a carboxylic bond, and that makes actually uh, glyceroids. Okay. So the glyceroids, you might have heard about the triglycerides. So the triglycerides, let's say, if one glyceride has a two um, astro linkage between fatty acid and uh, the glycerol. That's a uh, diglyceride. When there are three of them, so then it's a triglyceride. So in that way, it, it makes a different kind of glycerides or lipids inside a cell. The other example of a lipid is actually a phospholipids. So phospholipids. Again, uh, where fatty acids, which is a basic unit uh, in a fat, bound with a glycerol, uh, and uh, then the whole thing become a phospholipid because uh, you have fatty acid, which is a lipid, and then it uh, makes uh, it, it it combines with the, with the glycerol with the phosphate group, so it becomes a phospholipid. Then in a phospholipid, the uh, the head is hydrophilic, as we know, and the tails are. Uh, fatty acid chains are hydrophobic. For example, in this case, there are, there are two tails. So these are, uh, it's a dry, you can consider it a dry grass roll or dry diglycerides, or it can have actually three tails, then it becomes triglyceride. So in this case, uh, you will see this is a grass roll and bound with the carboxylic group with the with the f fatty acid chain uh, tails. So it, the whole thing becomes glyceride. And then when we have a choline or other functional groups, for example, in this case, it's a phosphatidyl dicholine. So there are different roles, there are different types of um, phospholipids available. So in this case, the example which is shown here, it shows you the phosphate side and then the hydrophobic side. And you will know that because the phosphate is a negative charge, and so that brings actually a negative charge and then that charge is composited with the choline group on the surface, so it overall becomes charged, and uh, negative and positive, so it overall becomes hydrophilic. The head becomes hydrophilic, and then the tail, which is just the hydrocarbons, uh, it becomes hydrophobic. So in a phospholipid uh, format, then the head is hydrophilic, and then the tail is hydrophobic. And that you have seen in a phospholipid bilayer in the cell molecules, so because their heads are hydrophilic, the tails are hydrophobic, so when you actually put these molecules inside uh, water, you will see they'll arrange themselves into this format uh, because of just a self uh, uh, assembly. And um, and uh, and you know where we are nowadays? People are looking into use the phospholipids to do what? To make nanoparticles. So phospholipid-based nanoparticles. So it means. If these phospholipids can arrange themselves into a certain shape, so then uh, can we use these phospholipids to make nanoparticles also? Let's say if we synthesize uh, or if we get some of those molecules and arrange them in some format that they, instead of making a larger 10 micrometer cell membrane, they make just a small nanoparticles and then they will be stabilized because of a hydrophobic hydrophilic interactions. So why can't we have just a phospholipid based nanocarriers, and then inside of phospholipid nanoparticles, we can have uh, different types of drugs, right? Uh, we can have a hydrophilic drug inside, uh, and we can also have a hydrophobic drug where maybe it will be then stay, it will stay there in this part between two uh, phospholipid, um, uh, between a double layer. So, and this is a very active area of research, a very active area people are using phospholipids as a drug, uh, base particles for drug delivery. And do you know what would be the major advantage of using phospholipid-based nanoparticles as compared to other polymer, PLGA or PLLA, or there are other gold nanoparticles and magnetic nanoparticles, so yes. They are very biocompatible because our human cells, most of, the cells have a uh, uh, cells have a lipid bilayer, so it means that uh, anything made up of a lipid, phospholipids, it should be biocompatible because inside our body cells degrade also, and uh, new cells are formed. So the degradation and getting moving, getting these things removed from a body is uh, our natural process, which is going on all the time. So it means if we have a nanoparticle, once it go there, they will disintegrate after some time. 
and and then they can be released through kidney or liver so uh, they can be cleaned from your body uh, with the time so so basically uh, this is a very biocompatible carrier and now think about if we make nanoparticles we we actually make them such that it has some drug inside the particle now we functionalize those particles with certain proteins like how the cell surface is functionalized right so then they can go and then we can inject them inside a blood for example and they can go everywhere and then find as chemokines like whenever there is infection or inflammation as shown in the video there are some chemokines released and that helps the red uh, the white blood cell leukocytes to bind certain areas and then in that way they can approach the area of infection to treat that infection that's why there is a lot of white blood cells there is a lot of cell communication going on within our body so whenever we have infection here for example uh, then all many of the wbc's actually come near by that area to defend your body against that infection so in this case let's say if we functionalize it, these uh, surfaces with some proteins which can bind specifically with the certain cell types so, and then later on, when it will release drug, uh, then the drug will only be affecting those cells, mostly will be affecting those cells with which these particles are bound, okay? So, it means we, it can be used as a targeted drug delivery vesicles or particles carrying different kinds of drugs, and we can also functionalize them to different cell types but again to find okay the cancer cell should show very specific biomarker or some specific protein on the surface which can help us to identify uh, that these uh, identify those cancer cells so we can have antibodies or so other uh, aptamers on these surfaces they can bind very specifically with those cells so in that way that's one of the uh, major area of all the where the pharmaceutical companies are working on how we can develop a targeted drug delivery as compared to uh, how medicine is being, uh, how people are treated with the chemotherapy and it's not very really targeted right now. There are other molecules, uh, one was lipid, uh, then the other are proteins which we have heard so far quite a few times, then there are also carbohydrates and nucleic acids. So in, in this course we'll be mostly talking more about the proteins which are more functional parts. So all these things which were moving uh, in the video, most of them are built off, built up off from proteins or protein based. So the proteins are involved in all the interactions. So the proteins, they are motor proteins which move things from one place to other place. Um, and, and there are proteins which are expressed on the surface. So the protein are expressed on the surface of a cell which allows them to bind with other things and so, and the protein is also used as a uh, receiver. So whenever there is a signal, so the protein, once it attaches to the protein, it knows, okay, something is going on, so I have to do this or that. So the proteins are very much involved in cell communication from cell to cell, and interaction of a cell with the body, and also the maintenance of the cell itself. And from where those proteins are made, it comes from a nucleic acid information where there is a code. So those two things are, we will be discussing more. For diagnostics point of view also, um, the proteins and the nucleic acids will be focusing more because this is how the current diagnostics is being done. So let's say if there is a, some pathogen or some uh, external virus, let's say get into our body, let's say Zika virus for example. So Zika virus has some RNA. So, and if we can find out if our, in our body we find that specific RNA segment, which is our body should not have that kind of a sequence. If we can identify that RNA, if that is present in our body, we can identify whether our body is infected with the Zika or not. Okay, that's one way. And also there are some proteins. So when the virus comes, it also have a lot of proteins packed in, like similar to when we make nanoparticles. So the viruses are 15 nanometer, 50 nanometer uh, small particles, which has a RNA inside in certain layers of proteins which make things more compact and in the shape and once it goes inside a cell like we are talking about delivering particles inside a cell and then they release their RNA which get integrated with our uh, inside a nucleus with our DNA and and that modifies become part of our DNA and then express itself then it expresses itself in 
in terms of generating more uh, RNAs or DNAs inside a, inside a body. So they produce more viruses from that sequence. So they have the sequence, but they don't have a machinery to uh, generate more viruses. So they, that's why many viruses use uh, our cell machinery to do the job. So, uh, but yes, we we will look at those things more. Okay, in terms of a polymer, when we talk about the polymers, um, uh, they are small molecules made up of monomers. The polymers, there are different types. Actually, proteins are also called polymers. And there are hydrocarbon chains. They are also polymers. And there are uh, when the monomers, which is single unit of, a, unit of a polymer, once they combine with each other, they they become larger molecules and uh, they have a higher weight, molecular weight, so we call them sometimes, also we call them macromolecules, okay? If we look at how much of, uh, what's the major building block, how much of human body is made up of what? So the living tissue, in this case, if you look at this example, uh, the water actually contains about 70% of the cells and then out of that 70%, um, the remaining 30% majorly is the macromolecules, right? Larger mo and macromolecules, then most is the proteins, major part, then we have uh, also nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and lipids. And you will see that majorly definitely is a uh, is water. Ions and small molecules is a small segment, but major macromolecules, most of the macromolecules, more than 50% are actually proteins. So it means inside a cell, except water, the major part is the proteins, then nucleic acid, which has a code, and then definitely carbohydrates and lipids, which are also important. And we'll go through those uh, uh, things one by one. So when we talk about the proteins, the major part, the building block of a protein, let's say how proteins are made, the building block of a single protein is what? Amino acids, okay? And there are I think quite a few different types of amino acids. We'll go through in detail what different types of amino acids are there. But uh, then these amino acids um, can combine with one another to make long proteins and or peptide chains. And then and then once you have the protein, then it folds it in a different structure uh, to make a complex. And that's why your protein, which you see, are not single chains. So they are very complex 3D structures. And that folding is very important for their binding and functionality. But the basic unit is actually amino acid, and uh, each amino acid can be represented with the three, I believe, RNA bases. So from where the RNA comes, let's say inside a human nucleus, inside the cell nucleus, there is a DNA, right? So when DNA, some section of that DNA is translated into RNA, through RNA is used as a messenger, it transfers that code to the ribosome, and the base on the code for every three bases, let's say A, T, T, C, for example, it generates certain type of uh, amino acid. So, and now you can think about why we are required to eat actually a lot of food, which has also proteins, because we need a lot of amino acids, right? And that's a major part of our body. If we don't have enough proteins, then our cells, how they can make so many new proteins so you will be deficit with the, the raw material. So you need a, a lot of raw material to build all those proteins for proper functionality. So that is, that's why it's important to take uh, food which has a, a protein also in there, okay? Um, then uh, they, there are uh, monosaturides, um, uh, like a carbohydrate, the, the major uh, uh, molecule complex is uh, uh, carbohydrates. Uh, in previous example, we see these carbohydrates, and the building block for carbohydrates is actually sugar or man monosaturides. Then we also have a nucleic acid, um, which is mostly genetic information. And nucleic acid, the building block is nucleotide, single nucleotide. And what is the, what are how many nucleotides we have? What different types? Four, right? Basically, there are other synthetic versions available now also. So they have more than four, but basically people consider four ATGC as a building block for nucleic acid. And we'll also see how they are arranged. And because when we understand the structure, how the nucleic acids, nucleotide um, bind with one another and make up a DNA structure, 
that will also help you to understand a lot of other technologies which have been developed around that. So, but we'll go through that one by one. So, I think we still have a few minutes. So, maybe let's look at, uh, I didn't upload it that one, but. Uh, okay. Um, there are also some functional groups which are very, very important and which give some specific properties uh, to the molecules. And, and uh, those functional groups are involved or those binding are involved during the protein folding and protein binding. And whenever you make different types of amino acids, these functional groups are also involved. And we'll go through, you might be familiar with some of them, but this is basic, I think, biochemistry where we'll look at maybe some of the functional groups which are very really important and are involved in making those macromolecules. So one of the most impo important uh, functional group, which is, uh, I'll upload these slides later on, okay, uh, today or yeah, hopefully today, uh, because um, I, so far I didn't plan to go over it, but uh, we still have time, so we'll go over it. So the first one is a hydroxylic, uh, hydroxyl uh, group, which is OH. So like when hydroxyl, mix with with a let's say when you have OH and then the H comes there it becomes a water right for example but most of the alcohols like uh, ethanol methanol uh, all that have the hydroxyl group there for example uh, in this case if you have a CH3 CH2 and it combines with the OH it becomes an ethanol okay and in that way you can also have a CH3 OH CH3 CH2 CH2 OH so in that way all the different types of alcohols can be generated with a hydroxyl group, and hydroxyl group is very important. So the only part which you are changing is actually the R, which can be had any hydrocarbon, and that, that's why you can have a different types of uh, alcohols uh, inside. You, you can have a, you can synthesize different kind of alcohols. There are also some aldehyde um, uh, chemicals which can be formed with the aldehyde. And the aldehyde bonds where you have a C double OH, so sorry, C O H, where you see is double, has a double bond now with the oxygen and single H, so this is a C O H. And then now, if we change this R with again CH3 or CH3, CH2, you can have a ST aldehyde or you can have a other functional groups. So there is also ketones where you have a C double O, and then now you have, because C has a four external electrons which it would like to share. So in this case, the two electrons are shared with what? Oxygen. So how many are left? Two more, right? So it means two functional groups can attach on the both sides. In the case of very commonly used uh, chemical, acetone, so it has a CH3 at one side and CH3 on the other side, where you have a C and double bonded with the oxygen in the middle. Um, and uh, in this case, because there was already uh, one hydrogen, there, so that's why we can only have one electron which it can share, right? So that's why we only have one functional group. Very important carboxylic acids or carboxyl uh, functional group, uh, which you will see in a lot of the things later on. So it's actually C double OH. So now you will see that C has a double bond with the oxygen, a single with the OH. And now what is left? Only one. So in this case, if we add CH3, it becomes acetic acid, which is uh, very commonly used, again, chemical in the lab. It can have also CH3, CH2, and other um, hydrocarbons, and they'll make the different structures. So basically, um, so far we have learned is uh, carb, uh, carbo, carboxyl, uh, C double OH, uh, ketones, uh, aldehydes, and alcohols, which is OH only, right? So in that way, uh, these functional groups give some properties to those chemicals. Just changing, for example, there is just CH3 here, and uh, with this functional group, it becomes STLD-hide, different chemical, and now uh, with this functional group, again, this, these are, there's a very much similarity between this one and that one. Only this part is different, which is functional group. You only have only one O, which tremendously change the properties of the chemical. There are also other functional groups, like amines, which is very, very important for uh, making amino acids. Uh, and you will see that when you say amino acid, uh, you will see why we call it amino, later, uh, amino acid later on. But right now, let's, uh, so this is very important, the NH2. 
So it has a nitrogen and H2. So all the uh, proteins have all, all the, because it's amino acid. So all the proteins have actually uh, amine group there. So that's very important. Um, so in the amine, you have a NH2, and there's N has a third, three outer electron which it can share, and this is now the functional group. Uh, it can make methylamine. Or now, if you add actually fatty acid, which I'll show you structure later on, then it becomes amino acid, okay, instead of R. Then we'll also have a phosphate group, again, very important. Uh, phosphate, why? Because deoxyribonucleic acid, uh, when we talk about the deoxyribonucleic acid, which is DNA, so every base of a DNA has a phosphate group. Which is PO4. So, and that's where from where its charge comes. So, phosphate has a minus two charge. And now, let's say you attach some molecules, so three phosphoglycerate, and you can make other kind of molecules also with that. But uh, but if you have a phosphate group, uh, then then it will bring a charge and certain properties to that molecule. And in DNA, we have a phosphate group in each base, and the phosphor helps them to like bind from one base to the other base. And that also brings, because the phosphor has a charge on the surface, it also brings charge to the DNA structure. And that's how the DNA can be electrophoretically uh, move inside the gels also. And or let's say when you apply a voltage between two terminals and we put a DNA at one place, it will move towards positive or negative? It will move towards negative. It moves towards uh, positive, yeah, from negative towards positive, because it is it has a negative charge, like electrons. So it has a negative charge, so when you apply a voltage, then it should move towards the positive terminal. And that's how uh, we can find, uh, we can run different types of gels also, which is new. We'll talk about the, what is gels later on, but uh, gels are used to actually uh, isolate and identify uh, the uh, different lengths of DNAs. And the, the phenomenon is just that. You, you make a gel, put a DNA there, apply certain voltage to so DNA, try to move towards the positive um, terminal. And uh, based on its length, it will move further. or It will travel less distance. And from there, you can quantify whether DNA is long or short. Because if there is more, it's longer, it will have a larger, more negative charge. And But it will be complex to move it to the uh, further distance. But we'll talk about uh, that in more detail. Then mitochondria, um, we already discussed about the mitochondria briefly. Uh, it's a very important organelle of the cell. And um, so it produces energy inside the cell in, in the form of adenosine 5 tri uh, triphosphate, which is a ATP. You might have heard about the ATP. The mitochondria itself has a different structure where you have a intermembrane space. Uh, there's also a matrix. Uh, Crystal inner membrane and outer membrane, so we'll not go into much detail because not very relevant. Is uh, if you want to learn more, maybe you can uh, read about it a little bit by yourself. But uh, um, or maybe you already know it from a high school. But from this course point of view, uh, we will discuss mitochondria very little. Uh, but I just want to again explain to you that it converts the uh, uh, energy in the form of ATP. That's why it's called the powerhouse. Uh, of the cell, so it means provides the energy. And ATP is the end product of uh, uh, many cellular pathways like glycolysis and other things. So uh, mitochondria also possesses its own DNA actually, uh, which is uh, apart from a nucleus. So there is a mitochondrial DNA, which is different than the nucleus DNA. So it has its own DNA, okay? Now, inside the cell, we did talk about the ribosomes, which helps actually to uh, make the proteins, right? The proteins are synthesized inside the, uh, in a, with the help of ribosome, and that's why we we'll also call it as a site of protein synthesis. And these ribosomes are present on endoplasmic reticulum, that curly structure was, which, has, which was inside, and in Endoplasmic reticulum also are present in two different forms. One is rough endoplasmic reticulum, where, which has the ribosomes incorporated on the surface. And then there's a smooth uh, endoplasmic reticulum, which lacks 
uh, ribosomes, it means the proteins are not synthesized there, but also, but it helps actually, um, uh, it, but it has some function in glycolysis of uh, glycogens or modification of small molecules. So it has again a role in functionalizing small proteins um, um, with the different groups, which is important for their folding. And uh, in rough ER, again, it's, uh, it's used to actually fold a protein and functionalize the protein. Okay, so this is how the endoplasmic reticulum looks like. And these are the small dots which are, which can be seen on the surface. Those are ribosomes. And, and this is nucleus, so this is whenever you have ribosomes on the surface of endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, it's called rough endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, but when you don't have rhizosomes, it's called smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And this is a real image that shows you the skill factor of that. Uh, okay, now let's uh, talk about the, one of the most important organelle, uh, which is uh, a nucleus. I think maybe we'll start, we'll go with the nucleus uh, in the next lecture uh, with more detail because I don't want to uh, start in, in a few slides. We have to maybe refresh it once again, so it's better maybe to just, uh, stop here. But do you know, before you leave, then the nucleus has a, a chromosomes, right? And the chromosomes are the X-type structure, right? You might have seen it. Do you know how many chromosomes are present um, inside human cell? 23, okay. 23 pairs, so <laughs> so it's basically 46 chromosomes, right? And uh, out of 46, so there are 23 pairs, so basically you have a 46 in total, and a 23 into two, and out of those, there are two, uh, one pair is actually, uh, which determines the sex chromosome, and the other 22 pairs are called the autosomes, so they, are, they don't have a sex letter information. So sex chromosome is very important for breeding later on because that will be involved. So your DNA from half of that will go into a one sperm cell, for example, half of that will be go to the other sperm cell. So so some sperm cells will have maybe X and some cells will have uh, X, Y. So it means that one can be boy or girl, for example. So that information is, but we'll go through that once again and we'll talk more about the nucleus in more detail because uh, the DNA and structure of the DNA and all that uh, we'll go to in more detail to those topics because that would be more relevant to this course. Okay, but I just still want to give you some overview what other organelles are there so that you refresh some of your memory uh, to some, so that you have some background, okay, where we are going. Okay, so we'll continue from here and then uh, in next lecture, but uh, on Thursday we'll be having um, uh, first presentation, right? Key paper review presentation. There are still, I think, one or two people who have not, who, who have not approved nominations yet. Um, I would strongly suggest them to talk to me or email me as soon as possible if they have any concerns. Like. This.